Hey, I'm Dr. Gordon Walker. Are you fascinated by fungi? I've had a lifetime fascination with fungus, and ever since then, I've been kind of obsessed. And so I wanna teach you guys all about the incredible variety of mushrooms and fungi and all the different ways they live their lives. So let's go check out the fascinating world of fungi. Hey, I'm Dr. Gordon Walker. We're out here in the hills of Napa and we're gonna go do some awesome mushroom hunting with Jasmine Smith, who's a Hi. Napa local and is a very accomplished mushroom phenology expert. <laughs> and Jasmine has actually got the most observations on iNaturalist for all of Napa County for all fungi and slime molds. I didn't know this until today, so that's really interesting. And I actually am really proud of myself, so that's cool. Yeah, she's only been into mushrooms for about two years, but has taken a lot of photos and been really diligent about documenting and uploading photos. I think that taking photos like the correct way is really important. There's a lot of people that just like take a picture and try to ask you what it is and it, it's really hard to go off of just the cap. So I do try to practice a lot. She does a really good job of capturing the top, the stipe, the textures underneath. And there's just a lot of things that you do kind of, I think you take photos for aesthetic purposes and out of that, it turns to be really, really good ID photos. And so you have become a mycologist and a community scientist by just being interested in mushrooms. Yeah, I, definitely, so. I don't know where the interest came from. I saw a mycena um, in a bed of wood chips at Walmart in our local Napa. So if you just look around, they're everywhere. And it's really, it's such a fascinating rabbit hole to jump down. I've learned from you, you've learned from me. She came on one of my forays a couple of years ago and we just became friends because we were here in Napa and had a chance to go hunting together. And so we're really excited to go find all sorts of cool mushrooms. We have lots of great mixed habitat here with tan oak and madrone and dug fir, a little bit of redwood and pine. Um, but it's a really special thing because this is sort of like a coastal-like forest, but it's up here at elevation in the hills of Napa. And so I'm really excited to go out and see what's here. I wanted to ask you, Jasmine, about community science because I think you're sort of a perfect example of how really anyone can become a mycologist mm -hmm. in the sense that like, I don't necessarily consider myself a mycologist yeah. because I've never taken a formal mushroom class. Okay. And although I have a PhD in biochemistry, mm -hmm. I still feel like a complete newbie when yeah. it comes to <laughs> mushrooms very often because I just don't know as much as I want to know or don't know as much as some other people. Mm -hmm. And I think even a lot of people out there who are like the very experienced uh, mycology and mushroom people don't necessarily have an official background mm -hmm. or education in mushrooms and one of the things I think is great about the idea of community science is that you can become an expert by just doing stuff yeah and that's kind of what definitely you did, right? yeah so the first mushroom I saw was um, out at Walmart in <laughs> Napa County it was a very beautiful gray that I, I had never seen before out in the wilderness I guess that mm -hmm. had to do with mushrooms and I never knew what benefits they had like in nature when I took that photo and I got home my partner um, he bought me a mycology book and I looked at the book and all of these photos of things that I could go see outside and I was mm. like oh my oh my god like I have to go do this so you kind of got a little glimpse of what could be and you're like oh my look exactly. at all exactly I yeah. was like I want to be somebody that could essentially like maybe make a photo book of my own I got so fascinated by the mushrooms and the photos and all the different colors that uh -huh. there were oh, yeah. you're sort of just obsessed with all like the colors and the shapes and the exactly textures and yeah and just like all of the possibilities that you could find outside um, um, and then I found out that you were local to mm -hmm. me and he was one of the first people that I uh, researched online. Uh, he introduced me to a lot of people that are really interesting, that are amazing female mycologists that, that I could talk to that really touched my heart a lot because I think that it's really powerful to meet other women when you're a young woman. Ooh, what's under this shrimp? Let's take a look. Unbury this. Okay, we've got sort of a brown top. What does it look like? Oh, probably a Cortinarius. I see a little bit of that spore print on the stipe and those kind of iridescent gills. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a Cortinarius with a nice fat bulbous base. Seeing you from age 19 to 21 now, yeah. you've become very empowered mm -hmm. with your ability to like learn and kind of ascertain knowledge and, and you don't currently have a college degree. Again, that's what's great about this is you don't need any credentials. You don't need exactly. an official 
education to become a mycologist and you're now making significant contributions in terms of like the things you're finding the way you're like looking totally. at the distribution of species you can turn a regular hike into a scavenger hunt really and it gets you outside for a lot longer oh yes what is the, yeah they look like or maybe nolania um it's probably entoloma those These look are, like entoloma yeah entoloma definitely we think this is probably like entolomiaceae um, so related to some of the other pink gills. It's kind of hard to tell. It's, it has an interesting smell. It's very mushroomy. It's more... Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's like very intensely mushroomy. It is. It smells... It's a tiny baby one, too. <laughs> yeah, it's very cute. <laughs> but yeah, no, I would guess that these have pink spores as well. Yeah. So this is like, we're talking about documenting biodiversity. Mm -hmm. This is where we should remember to like, take a photo mm -hmm. and then upload it to INAT. And we're doing my... We're literally doing mycology. Exactly. This is what it looks like. So basically you have to get three special photos. A photo from the cap, a photo of the gills, which is the bottom of the mushroom, and then you're going to want to also kind of get a photo of the stipe. And then if you want to add a fourth photo, if you want to get a little fancy, you can also get a photo of the substrate, which really helps narrow yeah. it down to what you want to identify yeah, it It's as. really important to take that contextual picture so people when you go to post it, it's not just a photo like in your kitchen, it's a full range and understanding of what, what this mushroom might be. One of the things I just realized recently, and this is what I did last night, was that you could take, uh, form a project on iNaturalist and take an entire geographic region uh -huh. and say, I want to filter this region by this set of organisms. Mm -hmm. And I just did Napa County fungi, as simple as it could be. And we're able to see all of the observations made in this county for all time by mm -hmm. all people. And again, that's where we found out that you were number one. <laughs> yeah. But it was pretty cool to just be like, wow, here's an, I've been meaning to do like a biodiversity survey. Yeah, and I have see, no like, doubt that if you and I were to do like a micro bio blitz kind of thing, that, that we'd find some good stuff. But now we have access to like this whole uh, history of exactly. everything that's been found here. And it also, what it tells us is we know that there's more fungi than we have observed in our naturalist, mm -hmm. which means that we should put in some serious work exactly. to continue to, to document all the other stuff that we know is here that's not necessarily on there. If I'm number one and I've only been doing it for two years <laughs> yeah. and there's people that have been on iNaturalist for years, like, you know, think about what we could yeah. contribute. Oh, it's a hedgehog. Ah! Not a chanterelle. Hedgehog, because there's little teeth underneath. Let me see. That's so exciting! I didn't know hedgehogs oh, could grow here. Look at that baby. There, That's are there any beautiful. more? Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, are there any more? I shouldn't be surprised because we're in this tan oak habitat, like we've been talking about. And so I think, like five years down the road, you could be inspiring people yourself, and and you know, starting your own trajectory of being a scientist and making contributions to our field. Yeah, I definitely can feel a lot of my peers and they ask me, hey, can I go out with you? Can I go find these mushrooms mm -hmm. with you? They are really fascinated by how many mushrooms I can find in just one walk. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel so good when I bring a brand new friend out to the forest and I'm like, look at that, look at that. And they get hooked also. I think it's an amazing opportunity for a lot of people to get back into nature after they've shied away from it for a really long time. And it's a sign that we get more people to come up here to Napa and help document what's going on. It's exactly part of what we're doing here in Angwin is not necessarily going out to look for edible mushrooms, but really just coming to try to document and understand the biodiversity and the health of the forest and the distribution of species. Mm -hmm. I know from a previous trip up here that I've seen sugar sticks, the Allotropa virgata, the uh, microheterotroph that grows on Matsutake mycelium. Yeah. And it's a good sign that there's Matsutake around. But what was really interesting to me is when my friend saw the sugar stick, he was like, wow, this is the furthest south this plant has ever been recorded. Wow. He's like, you just increased like the southern range of this, range of this mushroom by like 200 miles. And I was like, wow, I, <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought I was just like going for a hike, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's an amanita. So with an amanita, to carefully identify it, we have to sort of bring the bottom out. So we got to pop it out by the vulva and the nice kind of yellow top with those white gills, and of course it's full of springtails. Pretty cool little amanita. I'll just put that back in the duff. I think there's something just inherent about being out here that makes us care. It makes us be like, wow, what an amazing place. I want to preserve this. I want to document the biodiversity through community science, and I want to like affect positive change in my community to try to make sure that the health of the forest is maintained. Exactly. And not, you know, 
they don't build a parking lot here. Yeah, exactly. So. I don't want them. I don't want people to be afraid of being outside or like nature because there are a lot of people that think that fungus is like toxic to touch or toxic to eat at all in general. We can do tangible good in the world, and I think we can help the forest by being almost representatives or agents for the forest, exactly. helping people get over that fear that they have and showing them that there's amazing things here and then they can touch them, they can interact with them, and importantly, they can document them mm -hmm. and learn about them in a, in a sort of non-destructive way that is very much honoring the spirit of where we are out here. Exactly. So I've seen this too on our own hikes, that sometimes you pick a mushroom to, to take a photo, and you mm -hmm. put it back in context, you come back a week later, that mushroom is still there. It hasn't rotted out the same way that the ones that were still in the ground got moldy and rotted away. Exactly. And the one you picked is still there, potentially just, you know, distributing spores. Uh -huh. So I think there's something real to be said for human beings moving through nature as a proxy for animals and kind of messing around with mushrooms in a way that might not actually harm the environment, but potentially help it. Exactly. So let's go see if we can find a few more mushrooms. Totally. <laughs> I just found these two Sewillus, and this is a great example of probably like a wood rat or a squirrel that ate these mushrooms. And I found this mushroom upturned and this one sort of like discarded on the ground. And my first thought was, man, maybe there was like a forager out here who was being really careless. And then I was like, nope, there's little teeth marks all over this. And this one, the animal didn't eat the slimy top, but look, they preferentially went ahead and ate all of the pores. So pores have the highest protein content and so I can see why preferentially uh, a squirrel or a wood rat or some sort of little rodent ate all of that part of the mushroom. And they carelessly discarded this mushroom so much so that I thought a human had done it. But this is kind of what I'm getting at is like animals play a role in dispersing the spores of mushrooms in the forest. And the pores on this bolete would help disperse the spores in a generalized area around the mushroom. But a squirrel coming by and eating all these spores, and if those spores are ornamented enough or robust enough to just survive the digestive tract of that squirrel, that squirrel is going to poop out those spores somewhere else, and the spores will germinate and potentially form new mycelium. The animal can spread the spores much further than it could alone on itself as just a mushroom. So it's pretty cool to see this example of how animals interact with nature to help further the cause of mushrooms and fungi and spreading their spores.